more finishing. And um, she goes on to say, uh, already with the telescopes he's already using, he's discovered 1500 universes. How many more he can find who can conjecture? So uh, <laughs> what does she mean he's discovered 1500 universes? This is a typical way of referring to what we would now call a galaxy, in fact. Um, and so what she's saying is, in effect, that Herschel has discovered 1500 galaxies. Um, she says a little bit later in this diary entry, she'd hoped to see William's sister, um, who has again this reputation um, that Fanny is referring to here, whose knowledge in his own science is so extraordinary, and pointing out she was the first discoverer of the last comet that had appeared, and in fact, in Caroline's career, she discovers eight comets. But she's an astronomer, and so what has she been doing? She's been up all night, and so when Fanny turns up, she's in bed. Um, she then takes a famous walk through the telescope too, which was at this point on the ground. And she says at the invitation of Mr. Herschel, I now took a walk, which will sound to you rather strange. It was through his telescope and it held me quite upright and without the least inconvenience. Mr. Smelt led the way, walking also upright. My father followed after we were gone, the bishop, and Mr. Douglas were tempted to make the promenade. So, so people are walking through the tube of the, the great 40 inch reflector. So you get a sense of the activity of the construction, but also this is um, a scene which speaks to William's social prominence by this point. Five years earlier, as we will see, he was a completely obscure provincial musician, yet here he is, uh, a court astronomer to George III. Uh, he may have lost the colonies, but he patronized astronomy, so it's not all bad. Um, and by this point, Herschel has become the best known astronomer in the world. So looking at the Herschels, a little bit of biographical background. Uh, there are no likenesses of Caroline as a young woman. Um, the only image that survived is the silhouette. Um, William was born in uh, Hanover, November 1738. Caroline um, was born uh, 12 years later. Uh, William had a career as a um, musician uh, in the Hanoverian Guards, a position he really doesn't like, and he moves uh, a little bit later to England. Now, Caroline's life was affected greatly by the fact that at the age of four, she um, caught smallpox, and as she recounted, this meant... In, um, that she was well under five feet in height. Um, and she'd been, as she puts it, disfigured. And her father, again, this is Caroline writing, her father warns her that this is going to um, have a terrible effect on her marriage prospects. Um, and so this is Caroline. And I never forgot the caution my father gave me against all thoughts of marrying, saying I was neither handsome nor rich, it was not likely that anybody would make me an offer, till perhaps when far advanced in life, some old man might take me for my good qualities. And it was William who rescued Caroline from um, a life of domestic drudgery, when he goes to collect her, in fact, um, in 1772, and he brings her to England to, in effect, act as his housekeeper and general aid, and also participate in the musical 
occupations that um, pay his way. Now, this is the usual image of William and Caroline Herschel, the dutiful Caroline um, providing assistance to William. And we can see a range of astronomical uh, paraphernalia in the background here and on the wall. We've got a, a drawing Saturn, amongst other things. And a famous incident where Caroline describes how William did not want to take his hand from a mirror that he was working on, so she had to feed him. But Caroline, uh, I think it's been argued convincingly, is in the typical trap for a bright woman in the late 18th century, um, because being seen as bright is not often a winning social strategy for a woman at this point. And so Caroline actually, um, you could say, almost conspires in creating a reputation for herself just as the dutiful assistant. And we'll come back to this a bit later. But she was much more than that, uh, as we'll see as we go forward. So this is Caroline's um, self-presentation, you might call it. I did nothing for my brother but what a well-trained puppy dog would have done. I did what he commanded me. I was a mere tool which he had the trouble of sharpening. So why are we um, here talking about William Herschel as a figure in the history of astronomy? Well, he's um, a rare figure in that he's a highly successful telescope builder, highly successful observer, and a highly successful theorist. And what his career also um, underlines is the question that I will also try and address as we go forward tonight. I mean, who does astronomy and who pays? Because William um, was as I mentioned, basically an obscure provincial musician until he makes the remarkable discovery of the planet Uranus. And that transforms his life because that will secure him royal patronage. He can give up his musical career and he becomes a full-time astronomer at the age of 43. So these are the main dates. There will not be a quiz on these at the end of the talk, but I just wanted to put these here at the start just to help um, locate the Herschels uh, in this time period. And the key events for us really are the um, observation of what Herschel, as we'll see, at first thought was a comet. It's in fact the planet Uranus. He will complete what he calls his large 20 foot reflector. And then he will complete the 48-inch uh, reflector that had a speculum metal mirror about four feet in diameter. Uh, William will die in 1822, and Caroline will die at the age of 97 in Hanover in 1848. So let's pick up the story in Bath, which was uh, a, basically a spa town in the southwest of England, those of you who've seen uh, plays um, and um, films based on the novels of Jane Austen or read uh, Austen's novels will have uh, come across Bath. Um, it's a social uh, scene in Bath during what was called the season when visitors would um, come to Bath, many of them having left London behind in the summer. And so they wanted to be entertained. They wanted to go to concerts and so on. So William was helping fill this need uh, as a kind of impresario. He would put on concerts, he would take uh, pupils, he would provide music lessons and so on. And In his musical career, he writes over 30 symphonies, a wide range of other works, 
So this is one of Herschel symphonies on the left. You can find Herschel symphonies without any problem at all on YouTube, for example, now. And he becomes the um, conductor of a uh, chapel in Bath, and it's called the Octagon Chapel, and it's here that he will arrange for concerts to be held. And after Caroline joins him, she helps train the different choirs that Herschel is involved with. And here we can see there's going to be a performance of the Messiah. And who's taking the vocal parts? Miss Herschel, Mr. Herschel as well. Um, and so this is the kind of way that Herschel is um, making a living. He's putting on what he's called here a benefit concert and it's also how caroline is occupied she's effectively uh serving as housekeeper but it also she's also engaged in these musical activities and the herschels live at 19 new king street in bath this is now um the Herschel Museum, so you can go and, and visit this house in Bath if you're visiting England. And already by 1781, Herschel is a skilled telescope maker. And he's building reflecting telescopes. This is one on the right, we can see one of his reflectors, we can see the stand which allows you to push this around. Uh, sometimes he would observe in the front of the house with an instrument like this, sometimes in the back, and you can see the basic idea uh, is um, pretty clear where we've got the handles to adjust the altitude and you just turn the frame to point to different parts of the sky. And it was with such an instrument that in 1781, in fact, on the 13th of March, 1781, Herschel is observing, um, most likely in the front of the house, but that's uh, a matter of some debate, but he's observing at 19 New King Street. Uh, and between 10 and 11, as he explains in this paper, uh, he's looking in the neighbor, neighborhood of H. Geminorum, and he spots what he believes to be a comet. It's, it's visibly larger than the stars. Um, and nobody had discovered a planet in recorded history, so it doesn't occur to him at this point he may have found a planet. So he writes his paper on the basis that he's providing an account of a comet. But it's actually a major planet, the first major planet to be found in recorded history. What name to give this planet? Well, this is a, a, a work from 1790, that's about nine years after the discovery. Uh, called the epitome of astronomy, and the name of the planet that's been given here is Herschel. Just as uh, for a period after the discovery of Neptune in 1846, uh, Neptune was referred to quite often as Leverrier before uh, the name of Neptune was settled upon. But a key point here is that Herschel himself, under the guidance of friends who were well connected in the Royal Society, which is a major scientific society in Britain at this point, um, Herschel refers to it as Georgium Sidus, that is George's star. And so what he's going to try and do, as I say, he's being advised by a number of people to pursue this. Um, he calls it Georgie's star 
in recognition of the king. And so what we have going on here is a kind of gift being offered by William Herschel in the form of the name for this new planet. And as I said, this is a sensational find. Nothing like this has been uh, discovered in recorded history. And so Herschel is making this gift in the expectation that he will receive royal patronage. And the um, maneuver works. And it's worthwhile just reflecting from them. This is the same strategy that Galileo used early in the 17th century when he discovers moons moving around Jupiter. And he um, wants patronage from Cosimo, the Grand Duke um, uh, of, uh, uh, of the Medicis. And Galileo is successful. So he becomes uh, patronized by Cosimo and Herschel becomes patronized by George III. And the key thing for Herschel is he can now become a full-time astronomer. He can abandon his musical career. He doesn't have to take pupils anymore to whom he has to give music lessons. That All that stuff can be put aside. And he becomes a full-time astronomer and he receives a salary of 200 pounds a year. And for that, um, Herschel occasionally has to show interesting objects in the sky to the royal party who, um, uh, when they're at Windsor Castle, would be relatively close to where Herschel lives. And uh, Herschel moves from Bath in order to be um, close to Windsor Castle. So as I say, a, a, a royal party could come over. Herschel already has the appropriate social skills because he's learnt those in his time putting on concerts in Bath. He hosts um, uh, the, uh, members of the royal family and their, their visitors. And this is not onerous work, in fact. And so he's pretty much a full-time astronomer. So, as I say, lost the colonies, but patronized astronomy. So there's Windsor Castle, 1776. That's where uh, the uh, king and the court would often be located. And here's an historic document. And it's written out, in fact, by the king. And it refers to Dr. Herschel's uh, yearly salary, but also Miss Herschel yearly salary, because after a few years, Caroline receives a salary of 50 pounds. And this may well be the first time um, a, a female astronomer has been paid a salary to pursue astronomy, because in many respects, Caroline is also a full-time astronomer after this move. She had not been in the period in Bath, but William trains her to be an assistant for him. Although, as I say, we already, we really have to see Caroline as more than just uh, an assistant. Now, at the base of William Herschel's astronomical achievements was his skill with um, telescope building. And Isaac Newton had built the first working version of the reflector in the late uh, 1660s. And this is his drawing. The, the mirror, the speculum metal mirror, was maybe a couple of inches across. And this was little more really than a scientific toy, although it helps make uh, Newton's reputation. Um, earlier, there had been a number of people who had laid out the design of a reflector. Some London instrument makers had attempted to produce working versions of a reflecting telescope, but they'd not been successful. But what Newton does is to actually build 
a reflector, small though it is, that works. But for most of the 18th century, the reflector was little more than a scientific toy. But Herschel transforms the reflector into a serious scientific tool. And this is just, um, I'm sure for this audience, this is something that I don't need to uh, say much about, but to reduce the problems, particularly with the lenses available in the 18th century and also um, late 17th century, to reduce the problems of traumatic and spherical aberration, one way around that was to increase the focal length of the telescope. And that is the technical driver of what are known as long reflector, uh, refractors, sorry. And so this is an example, uh, Havelius in Gdansk, late 17th century. And you can see we have a pulley arrangement. And here's uh, Havelius at the rear end here. And the tube, uh, wooden tube. And you can see how inconvenient this is going to be in, if you're uh, attempting to track an object around the sky but the logic driving the length of the telescope is to try and reduce the aberrations that you're contending with that of course is the most famous uh, telescope made by Hevelius which is unfortunate because Hevelius was a highly skilled observer a fine builder of instrument but here he does what many telescope builders do in the 17th, 18th and 19th century, they, they just go too far and their ambitions run away with them. And this particular long refractor, which is a very long refractor, was just um, hopeless fundamentally. It was um, very difficult to operate. And you can see why, um, think of what would happen if you have even a slight breeze the integrity of the tube is another matter again. How do you track objects as they move across the sky? This, this is um, a highly ambitious but failed instrument. Sometimes observers used aerial telescopes. That is, they basically got away with a solid tube. And so here we have an observer and here we have the objective and again, the, the observer has got to move around in order to keep an object in the uh, telescope field of view. So if we put ourselves into the uh, boots of William Herschel in the 1770s, when he's first getting interested in astronomy, he doesn't have a great deal of money. Um, and so he thinks about making his own telescopes and at this point um you could buy some quite large reflectors but they are very expensive and they don't really work very well um refractors very expensive the, the lenses were expensive and also large lenses have not been built at this point so what herschel settles on is attempting to build reflectors and I'm pleased to say that one of the first books uh, he reads about telescope making and optics in general is a complete system of optics here. And this is by uh, Robert Smith. And uh, Caroline uh, writes about how often William would fall asleep buried under a copy of Smith Optics. And he wants to build bigger telescopes. And this is a feature of Herschel that he's always highly ambitious in terms of what he can construct in terms of telescopes. And so this is what is called the small 20 foot reflector and you can see that this is very similar in many respects to the long refractors we were looking at uh, a moment or two ago.
But you can see this is a, a perilous uh, um, way to observe. We've got this ladder here. Again, we've got the ropes and pulleys. You've got to move the telescope around or the base of the telescope around. And this really is not an effective instrument. But it's a kind of transition where Herschel has built a mirror. And in many ways, he's modeled it on the existing uh, mounting arrangements for refractors. So just to underline that point, Herschel's 20 foot reflector. And here we have a long refractor being operated by Hevelius. But with royal patronage, he's able to construct a 20 foot reflector with a much more workable mounting arrangement. And so here we have the intrepid observer on this A frame. We're on a turntable. The uh, turntable can be rotated. The altitude of the tube can be adjusted up and down. This is the mature version of the 20 foot. And you can see this is a whole order of magnitude better than the um, small 20 foot reflector that he constructed. Uh, and we can see the scale of this from the, from the figures in the image. And remarkably, this tube is, or at least it was the last time I was there, at the National Air and Space Museum on display. Um, so when I, I worked at the National Air and Space Museum for 15 years, and one of the things we were working on was a new exhibit um, that was called Explore the Universe. And so one of the things I, I suggested was let's Let's see if we can get the 20 foot tube for William Herschel's reflector. And incredibly, we were able to do it. And so I hope it's still there. If it's not, I will be uh, very disappointed. OK, and then again, Herschel is highly ambitious. He wants light, more light. And so how do you get more light? You build bigger telescopes with larger mirrors. So this is the telescope that Fanny Burney saw when it was under construction. It's a 48 inch reflector, um, 40 foot focal length. We've got the observing position for the uh, times the observer wants to use front view. We've now got this characteristic Herschel design where we've got the A-frame in play and we've got the observing hut that I mentioned at the start when we were discussing the telescope. But telescope making in terms of reflectors has been utterly transformed by this point by Herschel. Now the uh, 48 inch reflector turned out to be something of a flop. Um, it was just too cumbersome. The speculum metal mirrors and speculum um, Remember, it's an alloy basically of copper and tin. Sometimes Herschel would add antimony uh, to, to the mix to um, try to improve the, the, the brightness of the mirror. But the king had provided so much money for this 48-inch um, reflector that Herschel is really quite quiet, at least in public, on its poor performance. And that's uh, one of the uh, mirrors. And Caroline had been intimately involved in the telescope construction. And so even when they were in Bath, William Herschel was hoping to build a 36 inch reflector. Um, and Caroline in one of her autobiographies talks about what this involved. And so let, let me just read this uh, short extra extract from Caroline's autobiography, where she reports the mirror was to be cast in a mold of loam prepared from horse dung, of which an immense quantity was to be pounded in a mortar and sifted through a fine sieve. 
It was an endless piece of work and served me for many hours exercise in which she's assisted by her brother Alex. And Alex um, lived with, the, uh, with his um, brother and sister for a number of years in Bath, uh, the brother Alexander. Um, we were all eager to do something towards the great undertaking, that is, the, the construction of a 36-inch reflector. But there are all sorts of difficulties. Uh, and on one occasion, um, uh, metal escapes ends up on the flagstones and the flagstones start jumping and so it's necessary to make a quick exit from um, uh, the uh, furnace room. So as I say, Caroline is intimately involved in, in these kinds of activities. William also builds for her what he calls a comet sweeper so that when he's away, he would often go visit factories. He was fascinated with mechanical uh, works. Um, and uh, he would go and check on the latest kinds of technologies. Uh, Caroline was, would observe when he was away and he built for her what he called Caroline's Comet Sweeper. And with this um, instrument, she, discovered, she actually discovered comets. And um, there was a total, as I mentioned, of eight comets discovered by Caroline Herschel. Now, one of the interesting things is why does William Herschel want to build big telescopes? Well, two of the reasons are stellar parallax. He wants to actually see if he can see the disk of a star. He's also fascinated with extraterrestrial life. And in this, he's certainly not an oddity in the late 18th, early 19th century. Um, and so this is a page from uh, his observing book. This is quite early in his career, it's before he's discovered the planet Uranus. But if you read along here, I don't know if you can make out the handwriting, consisting of such large, I don't know if you can make that out, but it says growing substances. So he thinks he's seen forests on the moon. And again, just to emphasize the point, this is not weird or odd in the late 18th, early 19th century. We need to flip our thinking to see that this is actually mainstream astronomy at this period. Now, he will back off the idea that he's actually seeing forests, but one of the, as I say, one of the motivations to build a really big reflecting telescope is to see if he can see signs of life on the moon. And Herschel um, refers to this, 1780, so it's a year before he discovered Uranus. You know, it, it's beyond doubt, beyond doubt that there must be inhabitants on the moon of some kind or other. Right. And in the way that Herschel is thinking, as, as well as lots of other astronomers are thinking, why are there rings around Saturn? And Herschel's answer is so that the Saturn is a very long way from the sun. And so to help provide a bit of extra light for the inhabitants on Saturn, the rings will reflect sunlight and so make things a bit brighter. And this um, is a position <laughs> that again may look very odd, but it's not odd. <laughs> it's that's something I again I really want to emphasize. The past is a foreign country. They do things very differently there. And one of the things they do differently in the late 18th and early 19th centuries is to somehow or, or think that somehow 
the sun itself could be inhabited. And so Herschel's vision of things is at the very center of the sun, um, then there is a darker region. Inhabitants can exist in this region, and these inhabitants are protected by a kind of protected blanket. And then on the outside of the sun, we see the bright shining sun that we're all familiar with. And so these beings have organs adapted to the what he calls the peculiar circumstances of that vast globe. And this is uh, a section from a paper published in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, 1795. And arguably, the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society is the most prestigious scientific journal in the world. And so again, I want to emphasize this is not odd. This is how astronomers are thinking at this period. But it's really uh, Herschel's observations of nebulae and star clusters that makes his and really Caroline's reputation because the two of them, Herschel at the telescope, Caroline at the logbook, um, they discover something like 2,500 nebulae and star clusters when the total number before this time was more like 100. And Herschel sees himself as a natural historian of the heavens. He's gonna go and collect astronomical specimens and these are some of the specimens he observes he doesn't spend lots and lots of time on a single object but he's sweeping the skies for nebulae and star clusters and by sweeping it's essentially he points his telescope directly south and he lets the sky move across his field of view and so um Herschel acting as a natural historian, if we observe enough nebulae, maybe we can work out the um, life history of the nebulae. It's going to be hopeless if we just fix on one nebula and expect to see its life pass before us because that's just too short a period. But if we observe lots and lots and lots of nebulae, maybe we can piece things together and we can come up with the kind of life history of nebulae. Now, what are the nebulae, in fact? Well, the two theories in play at the end of the 18th century, maybe they're really distant star systems that have grown milky because of their enormous distance, or perhaps they are truly nebulous material that's relatively nearby to the sun. Uh, the Messier list plays an important role because um, when William gets a copy of this, he basically or um, follows up some earlier observations by pretty much handing Caroline a copy of the list and telling her to check things out. And it's Caroline's success in finding a few nebulae that nobody had ever seen before that attracts Herschel. So it, it's really in 1783, following Caroline's success that Herschel swings very much to the observation of nebulae and star clusters as his primary activity. And he was inclined initially to think all the nebulae are distant star systems, but then he observes the planetary nebula or what becomes called a planetary nebula in November 1790 where they seem to be a central star. This, of course, is a, uh, a modern photograph, but we have a central star with nebulous material around. So how could the star and the nebulous material coexist if this object was a distant star system? So at this point, Herschel is prepared to think that many of the nebulae do contain genuinely nebulous material, as he puts it here, a most singular phenomenon. The star is perfectly in the center and the atmosphere is so delicate, faint and equal throughout that there can be no surmise of it consisting of stars. 
Now, his mature cosmology I've, I've laid out here. And the idea essentially is that light is emitted by stars and nebulae. And in some places, the light that is emitted maybe is dense enough to form nebulosity. And so there will be small clouds of nebulosity. These might be attracted to stars in the form, Herschel suggests, of a comet. Some of the comet's material falls into the star and some of it could be driven to form a solid nucleus and maybe that would form a planet. Now, again, the specifics that Herschel is coming up with are not really so important, but the fact he's trying to understand how nebulae develop and evolve and how star clusters develop and evolve is a really key thing, I think, here, because this is highly novel for the period. And um, as the great Herschel scholar Michael Hoskin argued, basically each region of Herschel's universe is the scene of endless cycles in which light has a fundamental role and gravity is the great agent of change. And certainly evolutionary ideas were very much in the air in the late 18th, early 19th century, although they didn't use the term evolution, it would be more like transmutation. And uh, we're looking at some geological strata here that were observed by the very well-known geologist of the late 18th, early 19th century, James Hutton. And it's Hutton who comes up with what is now called uniformitarianism. The history of the Earth is to be understood in terms of small changes acting over incredibly long periods of time. And so Hutton writes a book, uh, 1795, it's called Theory of the Earth. It, Hutton is a very hard read. And so lots of people learnt about Hutton's ideas from a book by a, a, a friend of Hutton, somebody called James Playfair, who talks about Hutton's theory. Um, but a key quote from Hutton referring to the history of the Earth, um, our present inquiry, we find no vestige of a beginning, no prospect of an end. And so Hutton is here talking about what is now called deep time. And at the same time, Hutton is talking about deep time. William Herschel is talking about deep space. And he's thinking, you know, what is beyond the galaxy? And at one point, he estimates the distance to Andromeda Nebula to be 2 million light years. So this is highly novel stuff when the great majority of certainly professional astronomers very much focused on the motions of the bodies within the solar system. The stars were only of interest because they provided a grid against which you could observe the motions of the planets. So as I said, the evolutionary ideas in the air. One of the evolutionists was somebody called Erasmus Darwin, better known now, I suspect, as the grandfather of Charles Darwin. He writes a book, The Botanic Garden, 1791. Uh, and here he is, hence without parents by spontaneous birth, rise the first specks of animated earth. That is, the origin, talking about the origins of life. And of course, the mark, the famous um, the Markian mechanism, which is in the opinion of lots of natural historians at this period not really worked out, but the mark talks about um, how species can change by some sort of inner striving and the famous example uh, that Lamarck employs and that gets, gets picked up is the giraffe, where the giraffe wants to reach higher leaves on trees and so develops a longer neck. But it's important to keep in mind that Herschel is not an evolutionist. 
at least in terms of the overall structure of the universe. Individual objects can evolve, they can change. But overall, Herschel follows the idea of a static universe, not an evolving universe. So different parts of the universe can go through these different kinds of cycles, but overall, it's a static cosmos. Now, Herschel will say that his big project is to do with what he calls the construction of the heavens. And what that is, I've laid out, I hope, on the slide. Understand the arrangement of our own star system, that's the Milky Way, as well as the arrangement and development of other star systems. And so he's very interested in the structure of the galaxy. Um, other authors have taken a very different approach than Herschel. One writer was somebody called Thomas Wright, who comes up with an original theory or new hypothesis of the universe. And there's famously a case where uh, Wright's writing is misunderstood, and it looks like Wright has come up with what you can call uh, a kind of grindstone model of the galaxy, flattened. So that as we look along, if we think of a, a shell, which is what Wright was inviting us to do, think of a shell, then as we look along these directions, we see many more stars than we do in these directions. So Wright doesn't really have a grindstone model at all. What he has is a shell of stars, and at the center would be some sort of theological center, the eye of God or something like that, which is totally uh, out of um, William Herschel's thinking. He just does not go along these kinds of directions. The world is a natural place, unlike a kind of cosmo or cosmological theological vision being offered by somebody like Wright. So there's his model of the galaxy. It's really a sphere with some sort of theological center. Here's Herschel's own effort at mapping the galaxy. He, he, he does come up with a grindstone version. He makes a number of assumptions so that he can count stars. And these are the three key assumptions that, uh, that he has. So basically, if we have the assumption that his telescope can reach out of the borders of the galaxy in all directions, the stars are spread relatively equally, the stars are all e equally luminous, then counting stars in particular directions gives us a distance to the borders in those particular directions, or at least relative distances. But when he comes to observe with the 40 foot, and the 40 foot does not do a lot of astronomy, but here's one thing it does, it reveals more stars than the 20 foot reflector. And so the assumptions that he's made here that his telescope can reach the borders of the galaxy in all directions just hasn't stood up to the um, construction of a bigger, more powerful telescope. And um, later, John Herschel, this is after William's death. William will die in 1822. But, um, John, son of uh, William, takes a 20-foot reflector to South Africa so he can sweep the southern skies just as his father had swept the northern skies. And so here we can see the A-frame and we see the tube of the 20-foot reflector. And John Herschel becomes one of the most prominent scientists of the 19th century, in fact. And if you'd have asked somebody around about 1840, 1850, who is the leading scientist in the world, they may well have answered uh, John Herschel. So what have we got to sum up the career? I mean, it's a remarkable career. 
It's the discovery of the first major planet in recorded history. He transforms the reflecting telescope into a powerful scientific tool. He applies stellar statis uh, statistics to try and map the Milky Way galaxy. It doesn't really work, but he lays out the method. Discovers thousands of nebulae and star clusters, uh, total around about 2,500. And uh, this is a project for which Caroline is absolutely crucial. He produces a scheme um, of development for nebulae and star clusters as well. But a really important point, he's broken with this older positional astronomy, and he's created this radical new research program on what he calls the construction of the heavens. And again, just to underline this point, professional astronomers, round about 1800, are focused very much on motions. It's a, astronomy is a science of motions. It is not concerned with what we might call the mysteries of the cosmos, which is what Herschel's interests are in. Professional astronomers are concerned with plotting the motions of objects within the solar system against the grid of background stars, and then they would reduce those motions applying Newton's law of universal gravitation. And there was even a sense that astronomy had reached a point where all it was was dotting the I's, crossing the T's. We've pretty much discovered everything we need to be concerned with. And now it's a mopping up operation. But what William Herschel does together with Caroline is point to a very new direction for astronomy. And at the end of his life, very few people are prepared to follow William Herschel, but that would change over the forthcoming decades. So thank you very much. So I'll stop sharing at this point. Oh, let me just mention, Caroline dies in Hanover in 1848. And it's worth noting that John Herschel saw the planet Neptune without realizing it was a new planet. Now, if he realized it was a new planet, that would have been quite a coup for the Herschel family, Uranus and Neptune, but it wasn't to be. So I'll now stop sharing. Thank you, Herschel. Thank you very much, sir. That was very interesting, a very interesting perspective on a very important person in astronomy that a lot of people don't realize. And uh, we that was fascinating, actually, all the different connections. I We normally at this point ask if we have any questions from in here, do we have any in, in, our, in, in person? How about online? We have questions today? today? Okay, sure. Ken, you're on. Who's on? Okay, George is on, I guess. <laughs> George? Um, William Herschel and John Herschel use a 20 foot telescope in both northern and southern hemispheres. And I think that, that the main mirror was a 19 inch speculum coated mirror, and the flat was speculum coated. And speculum metal had what, something like 60. 60 to 70 percent of reflectivity of our mirrors today. Yeah. If you reduce this to a modern telescope mirror, wouldn't it be like a 12 to 15 inch uh, mirror that you could buy the name from Mead or, or uh, Skywatcher or one of these companies? And with that kind of telescope, he discovered 40, about, was it 4,300 objects? If you put John Herschel's Southern Hemisphere objects and add them to the Northern Hemisphere ones. So that's when amateurs go out and buy a small telescope of that size today, they can see an enormous number of objects if they had the kind of skies that Herschel had, which is free of light pollution, probably. And uh, is this true? I'm, 
Um, well, one of the things I, I tell my history of astronomy class when we go out and observe um, is, you know, they're, they're observing with, with telescopes because we go to the TELUS world of science in Edmonton. They're observing mm -hmm. with telescopes that were probably more powerful than those that William Herschel had. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, it's, it's also worth thinking, you know, after Herschel, there's this kind of British tradition of people, British and Irish, I should say, a tradition of wanting to develop reflectors. And so Lord Ross in 1845, 1846, builds this 72-inch speculum metal telescope. Mm. Uh, uh, and so again, I mean, how powerful are these? I mean, it's very hard to say precisely how powerful they are because often um, observers would use their speculum metal mirrors when they were not particularly <laughs> Um, in yeah. good shape, they they tarnish. Um, it's hard work uh, repolishing, even if you've got a couple of spare mirrors, uh, and so that would be almost the peak of, the, of their performance. Um, and so I I think that's you know I think it's a really interesting point that you know what's he observing with? Um, it's by our standards, these are not powerful telescopes, really. But what he's doing is trying to squeeze out <laughs> what performance he can. I, I think that's, that's a kind of key point because he is, I think Caroline makes this clear in some of these recollections where, you know, she's having to feed mm -hmm. William as he's working on the mirrors. He's, he's obsessed with getting these things right. Mm -hmm. And he also makes telescopes. He, he, likes making tele, he likes making telescopes. Now, he also makes money off these, these telescopes mm -hmm. as well. But he, re he, he really likes the act of making telescopes. And this, mm -hmm. I think, very much separates him from some of the other makers who tended to be commercial makers. And mm -hmm. it's what I think really underpins this effort um, to develop reflectors in the 19th century. And the, even as late as what, 1860s, the, the Great Melbourne Telescope is using speculum metal. So it's not as if speculum metal disappears um, shortly after William Herschel was active. It was still, it was still the material that give, give you the best light grasp, yeah. even as late as Lord Ross. Mm -hmm. Ken, you're muted. Uh, you, you have a question, your hand is up and you're muted. Okay. Well, yes, sir, you're, you're right here, go. Yeah, hey, thanks, Tom, from here, um, George Mason. So, uh, <clears throat> what, were, were people moving things? Physically by manpower, or was there some kind of um, gearing mechanism where, like running like a clock or something that was moving the thing in azimuth and elevation? Um, he has he has el helpers, basically. If you if you look at the um, twenty foot, you can see there are handles at the rear. And so he needs workmen to turn the turntable as well as turn the handles. And if I remove myself from my camera for a moment, <laughs> I, I will stand up and walk aside. And so I hope you can see the handles at the back. For, for, raise, for raising the, the altitude of the telescope and, for, uh, and also for turning. So um, by the time he's got to this scale, uh, the, the larger 20-foot reflector, it's not a one-person operation. So he's got Caroline, um, he's got one or two helpers, usually two. And so um, the fact that he's got royal patronage is a very big help. Thank you. 
Thank you. Did anyone else have a question? I think John Birch is asking, what did um, John Herschel think Neptune was? Uh, he thought it was a star. He, he just didn't distinguish it from the, the background stars he was looking at. Okay. Uh, I have a comment, and that is that uh, to follow up on your statement about the National Air and Space Museum, Yep. The uh, Explore the Universe gallery is under major renovation, and so I'm not privy to exactly what it'll look like when it reopens, uh, when it reopens, probably within the next few years. So uh, stay tuned. <laughs> yes, thanks. <laughs> well, I've got my fingers crossed. I mean, I, I would argue that that 20-foot reflector is one of the most important telescopes really in the history of cosmology mm -hmm. understood yeah uh, i'm a volunteer there so uh, <laughs> uh but uh they have uh, they have plans to redo that gallery completely yes i think they they're working their way slowly through the building okay well thank you anyone else got any other questions or comments yeah, I got, I got one. Ed Tacken, I still don't get how they are using these tremendously cumbersome telescopes. You know, 20 feet, even with helpers, it, it, they can't track a star probably, and they can't turn to look at something that they're exploring. Uh, did they just uh, know where they were looking in time and let, let the rotation of the Earth scan and write down what they were seeing? I think it's telling that William's basic method of, of um, looking for nebulae and star clusters was to sweep, as he termed it. That is, you point your telescope to the south, set the altitude, and let the sky come to you. Yeah, yeah, okay. And so if you look at... Um, <laughs> so if you, look, if you look at William's drawings of nebulae, they're... They look quite crude. I mean, these are not the highly detailed drawings that you would get, say, from somebody like, say, William Lassell in the middle of the 19th century, or even John Herschel, who does highly detailed drawings of lots of objects. And so he modified the 20 foot uh, reflector. So it was uh, an, a much improved instrument. And so you look at the kinds of um, drawings that John produced when he's at the Cape, um, there are individual objects to great levels of detail, whereas William was just hunting, basically. And if you look at the, the nebulae that William draws, it's really pretty crude sort of stuff because he doesn't have a lot of time as the nebula is moving through his field of view. Alan, yeah, Alan. Hi, thanks. Um, uh, one of the things you said before made me think. Did did Herschel understand the optical quality of his telescopes, or was he just satisfied to uh, get a paraboloidal mirror and get an image uh, that he could look at? Oh, I, I think there, there are lots of testimonies of other observers who, who observe with these telescopes. Uh, and, and they talk about the quality. And so, for example, the Astronomer Royal um, does that. And other people, um, or, or Herschel goes to the Royal Observatory at Greenwich, in fact, and he tries their telescopes. And he thinks, well, the, <laughs> I mean, he's struck. I mean, he, I don't know what precise he was thinking before this time, but I presume that he's thinking, well, everybody is, is able to come up with telescopes at least as good as mine. But he realizes his are better. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't think there's some sort of absolute standard he's got in his head. He's just trying to do the best that he can. All right. Thank you. And now one of one of the problems about um, 
trying to understand what Herschel is doing in the realm of optics is he's a maker of telescopes and he sells them. <laughs> so <laughs> he's not go, getting into a lot of detail in the when he describes his telescopes, he doesn't go into a lot of detail on the optics of them. Now, when he writes about the 48 inch reflector um, with the 40 foot focal length, there it's, it's a long paper, but it's a kind of monument to carpentry. There's hardly anything on the optics. You know, he's, he, he's not going to give away trade secrets to other people. He's worked hard to come up with. I got, I got another question. Uh, Ed Tacken again, as, as I understand it, it was Foucault who figured out how to test the parabolic shape of a, of a, uh, of a mirror. Yep. And I can't remember the date when he did that. Was he before or after Herschel? After, I think. That, so the, how was Herschel getting the shape of his mirror? Uh, the traditional test was a watch you would observe the face of a watch. And so you, you do it trial and error, fundamentally. You know, this, this, this is, and you, you can see why professional astronomers stick with refractors. They want something that's reliable. They don't want to have something that we have to take out and repolish endlessly, it would seem. To them, uh, that that's hard to test. You know, let let's go for something highly dependable that uh, we, we know is going to work night to night to night. The reflectors are somewhat idiosyncratic, um, and the performance is not always you know spot on. And so one of the things I think. Um, happens with Uranus, I think it's Uranus, yes, Uranus, the, for a period, William thinks he's seen a ring around Uranus. Most likely, he's just seeing telescope aberration, just because supporting the mirror is not a straightforward thing. And there were no, at this point, Nobody has come up with uh, systems of levers to, to act as kind of counterpoises on the back of the mirror. And so sometimes um, there will be blankets put behind the mirror. And I've seen uh, images where the blankets are also showing sort of little springs coming out to, <laughs> to uh, correct uh, as, uh, the gravity changes or gravitational pull on the mirror changes at different altitudes as well. And so th this is an evolutionary process that they're learning how to do all these things, learning how to do efficient tests. Uh, and the performance that Herschel was able to wring out of his instruments on the best days is still far superior to other telescopes as um, witnesses who come and observe uh, a test. So we're running late, late tonight, but uh, Alan, I can have the last question if you've got another one. No, I think it's good. Are you, are you, are you, maybe we just engage that. Okay, so I guess we don't have any other questions. Then. So thank you again, sir, very much. Very interesting. Thank you for your time. It was a great presentation. Um, I certainly uh, hope that you come visit us sometime in person if you're in this part of the world. Um, I don't think we're going to be going up to Alberta anytime soon. But anyway, we hope you'll come this way, and we'll, we'll see you at some point. But uh, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation tonight. My pleasure. Thanks very much. All right. And that will wrap us up for tonight, and everyone have a good evening, and we'll see you uh, hopefully in Sky, at the scar, uh, sky Gaze um, uh, in two weeks. Thank you. <laughs>